Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're here to continue our expectations series today, and we're going to talk about a couple of players. Uh, Devin Leary, a six-round draft pick at quarterback, and Roquan Smith, uh, the well-known inside linebacker. I don't think we need to, to say much more about him, but uh, Brandon Croxton is here to talk about it. Brandon, how you doing? Hey, Ken. I'm doing good. Uh, love doing these, and it's a very fun, uh, very fun segment, so I'm in, looking forward to it. Oh, appreciate that. I've, I have a ton of fun doing this. And, and you know, we have 29 shows this year and it's 29 different people. Uh, didn't have any problem finding people to, to, to do it. Everybody was excited about it. And so this uh, this seems to be one of the, the fun things that people we get between about the uh, mini camp period and the beginning of camp. This is one of the big things to talk about is our expectations for these players. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, how about we start with Devin Leary since he's the the undercard to this pairing for certain. Uh, drafted in round six, number 218 out of Kentucky. A 6'1", 215 guy, really made a name for himself at NC State where he played very well for four years. Uh, 62 touchdowns and 16 interceptions. Then moved on to the SEC in 2023. Didn't have his best year. 88.7 passer rating, 25 and 12 on the on the uh, touchdowns and interceptions. Uh, what, what were your first impressions of the pick? when it happened yeah um i i would say you know it's interesting in the that he'll be 25 at the start of the season so he's definitely on the older side um he's um definitely somebody i think probably could have been an undrafted free agent but Mm -hmm. obviously i'm i'm guessing that the ravens see something in him that uh that's a positive um that they think is worth a six-round pick um, you know, like there, there's some upside and some downside to him. His 21, his 2021 season was an excellent season. He had 35 touchdowns, um, and just five interceptions. And, you know, he did this led, uh, NC state to a nine and three record, which is very good for NC state. And, um, you know, he did this without having an NFL wide receiver or tight end on the roster that year as well. So, it, you know, that's. You know, that's something that's, you know, looking for, you know, looking forward to, you don't you don't have, you know, like a cheat code, like a Marvin Harrison Jr. on your team that's mm-hmm. just out there dominating and he's just getting the ball to him. He's kind of making a lot of plays on his own to have such a great season. Um, and um, but yeah, like, I think it's interesting that he's he, he was drafted. Um, he probably somebody that you could pick in. You know, you could be a priority undrafted free agent, but maybe they just see they fig- they feared somebody was going to take them maybe in the seventh round, so they just grabbed them then. They had at least one pick in the seventh round this year, so it's a little funny that they that they didn't wait until round seven to get. I mean, Sanusi Kane was their seventh round pick, another guy who could have been had as a UDFA. I'm pretty sure. Um, but the other thing, I mean, some of the draft pick value. This is really strange, but sometimes. If you have priority UDFAs you want to sign, you can't set yourself up to have three or four of those because you won't have enough money for them. So those guys, and Keaton Mitchell was a good example last year, but there have been others in other years who are, are highly touted around the league. And so they 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 have three or four suitors at the max dollar amount they can pay a UDFA. And so they, they maybe not three or four, but they have more than one suitor that they that that would that would pay them that money so you can't have three guys you're competing on um and, and you'll you'd spend more than the total amount in your pool to to do so so uh i've always heard about this uh, you know the, the, the way the process works and the, the way they've got you know 20 different guys on phones talking to their the people that they scouted or the people that they have the closest handler relationship with um and it's it's uh it's very much a thousand dollar at a time kind of business which doesn't seem like those those chips are all that important but they are when that's all you have <laughs> to play yeah. with and every team's <laughs> working with a restricted amount right exactly yeah and um so you know i think i think it's interesting um how you know he is kind of um very different from the uh, backup quarterbacks from Lamar um, in the past. Like we've had uh, Tyler Huntley the last four years. Um, They drafted Trace McSorley a few years ago. Um, Those two are mobile quarterbacks, um, you know, kind of can kind of do not as well as Lamar, but can move around and kind of do some things that are similar to the skill set that Lamar brings. Um, 
uh, uh, Leary and uh, Johnson are both straight pocket passers. They're not you know, he's not a statue in there, but he's not going to be somebody that's going to run around, make plays off script or kind of run an RPO uh, or or run option to, you know, make plays with his feet. He scrambled only nine times uh, this last season. So he's the pocket passer in the strictest sense. That's a, that's like a Joe Flacco number uh, in terms of a, a, a very low number. Uh, mm-hmm. He's not a big guy either at only 6'1", 215. And one of the problems that he had in, in Kentucky was he led all of college football in batted passes with 17. That's 4.6% of his throws were batted down at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, that's a that's, big that's, cut. In that's tier. rough. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's rough. Yeah. There were only I mean, eight other QBs in the entire uh, uh, FC. I always get that wrong, so I'm not even going to try. In college football, who had 10 or more um, uh, batted passes. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I think, it, you know, it also kind of signals probably an evolution of the offense in general um, with under Munkin. Um, last year, Lamar actually had the fewest design runs of his career, um, minus the 21 season where he missed six games. But, um, you know, he had the fewest design runs and the fewest uh, yards off off of off of those runs in his career. So we might be seeing kind of an evolution of more of a kind of a straight back uh, passing game, passing attack, as opposed to a lot of run option, a lot of using Lamar as as a runner um, instead letting him kind of be more of a passer and scramble, break, break, make plays with his feet, you know, getting out of the pocket and, you know, still looking for a receiver downfield or scrambling then, but few, fewer design runs. And that's probably, you know, maybe that's something that we're seeing with um, Leary and Johnson, because I mean, Tyler Huntley signed with the Browns, but he only, he signed for barely the, the vet minimum. And mm-hmm. they have they literally have four vet, veteran quarterbacks out there now, so he may not even be guaranteed a roster spot with them, right. you know. So, I think Huntley could have been had for you know pretty much the same deal. It was one one point two million for a year, it, but the Ravens kind of made an affirmative choice not to bring him back. Yeah, it's a good point, and it's not a long term deal when you're you know you're signing a thirty seven year old or whatever Johnson is now uh, to to do that. Whereas Huntley. You could have maybe had a couple more years. It's a clear sign that they're done with Huntley. I mean, to me, yeah. to me, it is that, that that he had limitations that they just couldn't live with and and whatnot. And we may not know what all of those are from from the Ravens' perspective. We we can kind of see some of them on the field in terms of being a linear runner and more of a speed guy. We can see some of the way the offense had to be schemed to get the ball out of his head quickly from pocket awareness. But something tells me that might not be that might not be all of them. That that might just be a, a a part of it in terms of uh, things that were not great. Um, anyway, I, let's get back to Leary for a second because I don't want to I don't want to just bash Huntley. That's not necessary. I think it's it's possibly by the way even Huntley could be back on the Ravens practice squad this year. That that it's uh, you know he, this is a reasonable home for him as any, and you know it's a way to extend your NFL career. Um, yeah. The other thing about. Um, Leary, he obviously played in his bowl game last year, which I thought was a good thing. He probably had something to prove. Uh, played very well against Clemson in a game where he gave them two fourth quarter leads at 28 27. Then again, at 35 30, the Kentucky defense couldn't hang on. Kentucky always kind of in a difficult spot in the SEC. They're not in the top tier of that league, and yet they, they, Seem to have been pretty good in recent years at staying in the in the in the middle of the league. Which, by the way, if you can if you can be seven and six with your schedule being primarily in the SEC, which is what Kentucky did this last year, that's pretty freaking amazing. Yeah, you're you're a pretty good team, um, yeah. and yeah, they've you know they I, I remember kind of watching that game. Um, not him. Leary didn't really stand out to me. He made a couple of nice plays, but uh, mm-hmm. the running back Davis really kind of yes. showed 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 something to me that game. And I remember him. Uh, you know, he had a, he was in the back of my mind come draft day. I was hoping the Ravens would get him in the mid rounds, but yeah, he's um, right. yeah that was a uh, yeah Kentucky's a, a a tough place to compete. So he he definitely has some battle scars uh, playing in the SEC. All right. 
Now, with Leary, and we talked about the undrafted and some of the reasons why they might have used a draft pick on Leary, but they really did give up on a player who could have really helped them, I think, in terms of of what they're doing. The guy that I wanted at, at uh, 218 was Trey Taylor of Air Force, who ended up being drafted 223 by the Raiders. He actually won the Jim Thorpe Award, which is, I think, given to the best defensive back each year. He won it over Cooper DeGean. That is a pretty, it's you know, it, it not really well known in terms of the available safeties out there. But when you're looking for the specific traits you want, good instincts, not necessarily the top end speed, um, he'd be a guy who who would be kind of uh, ideal, I would think, to play the back end and allow the flexibility to um, uh, Hamilton to to be up or back by play. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think you know maybe and we'll kind of talk about this a little bit more. Maybe they see Leary as you know, he definitely has a roster spot as a third mm-hmm. quarterback and maybe, you know, he, he would Taylor would be kind of com, uh, competing, you know, with uh, Worley and, you know, yeah. who's potentially coming back or, you know, any other safeties that might still be out there that they sign over, you know, the next month or so um, leading into camp that makes it a little bit harder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, well let's let's move on. It's uh, he's the undercard after all. What's a, what's a good season for Devin Leary? Yeah, um, it, it, I had number one is make the team as the third cornerback. Um, I think it's very likely, you know, but I wouldn't put it as a hundred percent he's going to be on the roster. Um, they did uh, bring in another UDFA and Emory Jones um, to compete with them as court as quarterback. So. Um, number one would be making the uh, the roster and. Um, kind of going from there, you want to establish himself as um, a front runner to be the second quarterback in a competition uh, heading into next year. Okay. Uh, very similar. And I've got two things. A couple of them are, are we won't even know if he's, if he's done this, but I'll just read it. Uh, has a solid preseason in camp, earns the QB3 role. That's a match with you. Sees no more than a handful of regular season snaps. That would be a big positive if he yeah. didn't see a lot of time this regular season. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> builds rapport with some receivers who will still be around in 2025. I actually think that helped Lamar to be throwing a lot to to players like Mark Andrews back when he was a rookie. That uh, you know that, that was a that was a positive thing where Boyle and other other tight ends were getting uh, uh, snaps with Flacco at that point. Um, uh, learns and hones positional skills prior to 25. So again, we won't really know. It could be like a Lamar situation. He comes to camp, all of a sudden his mechanics are improved, or or he's he's making a lot of throws, and we're saying, "Wow, this this guy had that kind of arm." I didn't know. Um, mm-hmm. If if that happens prior to twenty five, I think it's a good twenty four for him. But you know, pick up what you can. A few little rapport components. You probably make the roster as QB three. You hold a clipboard this season. You 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 stay very focused on learning the NFL game, and I think uh, I think that's a good year. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he, and hopefully, you know, he's here with uh, Tavian Robinson, who's a UDFA. So that's his teammate. So maybe we'll have some buzz talking about in the preseason. Uh, Leary to Robinson is a nice uh, one two combination, but yeah. hopefully we don't see either one of those uh, at all come week one. Good, good point. So but it, the, either one has the potential to be a camp darling based on their play. But you're right. As a as a team, they might be better. How about a great season? What's a great season for uh, Leary? Yeah. I would say show enough uh, in the preseason and in practice uh, to be the unquestioned second quarterback in 25. So at some point kind of beat Josh Johnson out as the second quarterback, maybe possibly during the season or you have a, you know, or just show that you're definitely going to be the number two guy going into next season. Cause it, Josh Johnson's up there in age. He's 38. Now he, you know, he's, at the end, at the end of his career, it's a year by year. So having somebody who's younger, that can be a cheap option, um, kind of similar to like Tyrod T- Taylor was as the second quarterback as the backup here, um, you know, can be extremely valuable to the team. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. That's very good. I'll just say outstanding practice in preseason has him assume the QB two role by midseason. There's nothing in my way of thinking that has Josh Johnson locked into that role for the whole year. Josh Johnson can be, you know, emergency QB three at any point this year if Leary is really the guy they want to use second in a game. But they do they do have to decide on a week by week basis. 
uh, uh, how they're how they're doing that. Uh, Chain, I'll say, plays a limited number of snaps in mop up duty. He could also get a trial by fire in the top twenty percent. That wouldn't be a good thing for the Baltimore Ravens, obviously, but it, but it, it could be a good thing for him. His change of pace provides intrigue. It proves intriguing to coaches, and the Ravens scrap their longtime trend of having a stylistic match for Jackson. You said a lot about that earlier. I don't need to go further. The Ravens like him enough not to draft another QB in either two thousand twenty five or twenty six. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. All right. All right. Let's. Uh, Let's move on. Talk about Roquan Smith. Then is there any, do we have anything to say about Roquan Smith? Oh, gee, you know he's, <laughs> he's uh, only my second favorite player behind uh, Lamar Jackson here. So yes, I was very excited to talk about Roquan. So um, you, you didn't pick the, this peering to talk about Larry uh, Leary. Oh, he, he, he the, that was just the uh, icing on top right there. Very good, Kevin Leary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, Roquan Smith, we traded for him uh, in the 2022 season, um, and he played uh, nine games in 22, and he pretty much instantly made the defense the best defense in the league um, that year, and that even carried over to 2023. Um, I'm generally not a fan of um, trading big-time picks and paying a player, um, you know, like the second round is definitely the highest I would go. I would very, very rarely go a first round pick and pay a player a big, you know, a big time contract. But I mean, Roquan has just um, been absolutely worth it as far as um, what he's brought on the field um, and as a leader, as a team taking over the green dot, um, you know, in the in the those eight games before he got here in 2022, the defense was really plagued by a lot of miscommunication errors um, mm-hmm. and just big plays going all over the place. I mean, you think back to the Miami game where couldn't even we could barely even get lined up correctly, or even that New England game where people were just running wild in our in our backfield. And when we traded for them, like literally all of that stopped. Um, you know, the big plays were were halted. The miscommunications were absolutely just, uh, taken away. And, um, you know, those, uh, you know, that can almost directly be attributed to, you know, Roquan's arrival. So, you know, he's, he's, you know, been a first team all pro, uh, these last few years, and he's just been an awesome, awesome player. I have really appreciated the similarity between the Ravens and Orioles in terms of picking up scrap heap players in the Elias era and the DaCosta era as well. I mean, the DaCosta era, first of all, you know, coming in in 2019 in his first year as a GM, the Ravens had a great freaking football team, but they had a defense they needed to fix on the fly. And the Marcus Peters trade was just part of it, but we'll come back to that in a second. I mean, they, they had two inside linebackers. They got two, two um, uh, nose tackles they brought in. Uh, they really put together that defense on the fly to – um, fix what was a very much a flailing unit through four games in terms of, of what they'd done. And, you know, Josh Bynes is, is a name that's often uttered on this, on this show, uh, along with LJ Fort, uh, Ellis and Pekka were picked up on the defensive line. And of course, Marcus Peters was the, was the um, uh, crown jewel of the acquisitions there. Uh, it's getting back to the comparison of the Ravens and Orioles though. Uh, Marcus Peters was a guy who was on the scrap heap at nine, over nine yards per target with the Rams that season before he came. And then all of a sudden, by the end of that year, he's all pro one. Yep. You know, so, mm-hmm. so that was pretty spectacular. You know, his first week, he has the big pick six against Seattle when when um, uh, Russell Wilson hadn't thrown an interception to that point. Right. So I, yep. I think that's right. I think he had thrown an interception. And it's very similar in terms of the Roquan uh, pickup. Roquan was a very uneven performer in his times with the Bears. There were highs there. There were flashes there. There was a great player out of Georgia. There was a great pedigree with an eighth overall pick. But his performance had been very uneven. And I think basically, in particularly some of the troubles he had as a run defender were problems with the defensive line not being stout enough to – maintain offensive line blocks for longer and he's done very well worked extremely well uh with jones with pierce with the other interior defenders campbell and others who, who who've been here for the time he has been um uh to to work very well with those with those groups and structure has been fantastic for roquan here 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, and, you know, another thing that I just love is he's really t- taken on the leadership role of a typical middle linebacker. Um, I mean, he's he's kind of that heart, the heart and soul of the defense. He, you know, gives the pregame hype speech. He wears the green dot. He's making all the calls. Um, I mean, he's he's just been just a f- phenomenal leader here, like to give kind of like an 80s uh, cartoon reference, he he's the head with a Voltron right here, like the Voltron. The, okay, no, that's yeah. see, that's that's after my time watching cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, yes. It's, yes. It's, it's, sadly, Fat Albert and Scooby Doo were probably my era, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, oh, the the, wait, we always watching Scooby Doo and Fat Albert too. I'm a little younger, but yeah, okay. that, yeah. Um, <laughs> Voltron was, you know, they they have these mechanical. Uh, robot lions and they all form to 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 uh create voltron who was basically the unstoppable godzilla type robot that could defeat any any enemy uh Uh, out there so yeah that seems sort of unfair (laughs) (laughs) yes yes and Uh, and, you know you know roquan is just you know he he's the guy you know like he just brought it all together and it, and, and it was not just his play, which has been spectacular, that has created it, but the leadership and, you know, the taking on the the defenses and making it his own really has just allowed everybody on the de- team to flourish and, you know, and, and make this the best defense in the league the last two years. Yeah. Well, the Ravens have two emerging superstars on the defense. And I'm not going to include Matt BK in this group, even though I think he's a very good player or Owe, who I think is a very good player or the corners, all of them who I think are good players or Marcus Williams, even, I mean, they obviously have a lot of good players, but the two great players they have are Roquan Smith and Kyle Hamilton. And if you look at them as the sword and the shield, no doubt about it. Kyle Hamilton is the sword. He is the offense of that defense going and making plays wherever is needed. Roquan is the shield. He is filled in at whatever way is needed to maximize the value of this defense. And I want to get into some of that later, um, but we'll start with this. The first three weeks of the season, Roquan Smith rushed the quarterback 35 times. He only rushed the quarterback 70 times more in the remaining 15 games of the year. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, 15 games that he played. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they morphed his role to basically say Patrick Queen – is, is going to be short in the coverage elements of this. We trust you more in that regard. So we're going to use him more as a pass rusher, and we're going to use you more as a pass defender. And even though sometimes Roquan might be doing his things, A, less flashy, and B, might even be less less his strength as a player, though he's a great coverage asset. Um, uh, he's he's doing something that's that's for the – because the team needs him to do that thing. Whereas mm-hmm. Hamilton, you're putting him where you can make a play. You're, you're, you're lining him up where you can. And he does. He has some other ancillary benefits of he takes away the strong side of the football field, which is yeah. a hell of a shield type thing to do. But <laughs> but he also yeah. rushes the quarterback. He drops a coverage. He'll, uh, yeah. you know, does all sorts yeah. of things anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Hamilton's, you know, he's he's that game wrecker when he's near the line, line of scrimmage. It's you know, wide receiver. He's, he eliminates wide receiver screens, outside runs, everything like that is. He just eliminates, but, and, you know, Roquan is just that, you know, he's that missile that fires and just takes off to wherever the ball carrier goes, whether it's short pass, he's, he's coming and he's, you know, he's filling gaps. Like I think of, you know, that very first game against the saints, uh, it was a third and one and the out, the, the saints had it blocked and for Alvin Kamara to get a, to get a easy first down and Roquan just came in and took off like a missile and stopped him dead and dead right at the line of scrimmage for, for no gain. And they had to, they had to, uh, they had to punt and that plays like that. It, you know, it's, it's just a tackle. It's not a tackle for loss. It's not a sack or, you know, know, anything like that, but plays like that are just huge. Get get your team off the field. they, They do count them in one way and that stops. Okay, so de- defensive stops are the defensive wins by the old football outsiders definition. And PFF has them. I've been touting stops to miss tackles as kind of a strikeout to walk ratio for inside linebackers. It's also good for defensive linemen. But in particular, it's good for inside linebackers. He he was at 
54 stops, which is actually down some from previous years, and 13 missed tackles, which was still right along his career average for a 4.2 ratio. Not quite at the top of the league and not quite the highest he's been in his career. I think there's some reasons for that based on some compromises the Ravens were making in their run game, by the way, uh, that, that in, in run defense relative to pass defense. But still uh, high up in the league. Bobby Wagner was around. Uh, he had a fantastic year. He had, it was it was over seven um, in, in stops to missed tackles. And Levante David also had a big year. He's over six to one. Uh, but there aren't very many guys in the whole league who are over – four to one and Roquan has consistently been that he's had better years in the past because his career rate is 4.9. Um, but it's, it's, it's very hard to find inside linebackers who make that many effective plays and miss as few tackles. And it's just a great combination to have. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I also want to talk about, I thought his usage of pass rusher dropped for multiple reasons. I, I, I kind of went into one, um, but the Ravens went to a lot of four man pass rush this last year, more than they've been doing in previous years. They kind of had a budget. It seemed like for the number of five man rushes they want to use on a per game basis. Uh, so that was, that's obviously eliminating places where Roquan is going to do unless you're, you're dropping. But one of the problems with dropping this year was that the real lack of a quality Sam linebacker to drop. So they ended up dropping interior guys and doing some doing some things with that, but they but they didn't have the number of coverage drops they've had in past years when Tyus Bowser's been healthy, or when they've had other guys like Matt Judon say uh, who were really high quality coverage assets they could drop from the outside linebacker position. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and Roquan's been great in pass coverage too. Like yeah. he's yeah, I mean covering tight ends, covering running backs out of the backfield. Um, you know, not very rarely getting out of position when they throw it short. So, you know, a lot of times, it, like if it's third and five, third and six, a defense, an offense will throw it to a running back, out, you know, and make the running back make a guy miss and get that first down yeah. or throw it to a tight end, something like that. I mean, Roquan, he, he takes great pursuit angles and will not – very rarely gets juked to get, you know, for the running back to get that first down, he'll get that running back out of bounds or he'll put him on the ground before he gets that first down. And I mean, yeah, yeah. Like he's, he, he's everything you want. I mean, in a linebacker. And I mean, he's, you know, him, him and Fred Warner are definitely the top two. And I would probably take Roquan every day. All right. All right. Definitely. Uh, uh, a great awareness I've always found of where the first down line is almost like he can see the yellow line on the field. Um, and he's playing with it to try and make downhill stops and whatnot, not taking unnecessary chances uh, on the angle, which is what you're talking about in terms of pursuit angles are good. Uh, if you know where the line is, you got a good chance to to push the guy out of bounds because the line is also marked on the sideline. Maybe that's a bad analogy, but, uh, <laughs> but it's what it is. No, but it's a lot of players that don't, have, yeah, have that awareness all the time. So yeah, the fact the that worst, he does. Yeah. Worst thing you can do as an inside linebacker making a downhill stop on a pass play is to put up your fist for fourth down when the guy's two yards behind the, or past the the marker. <laughs> that really looks stupid. <laughs> Just if you're understanding it. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. He's he's going to spend time with Trenton Simpson this year at weak side linebacker and presumably also or, or possibly also with a dime. Um, but, you know, I, I personally feel like his fate is very closely tied to how well Simpson adapts to the NFL based on having Roquan as a partner. Now, I, I, I and fair and unfair, I've come to expect that after the way he basically uh, shored up Queen's career and made him a very saleable commodity. Yeah, um, it's it's going to be interesting. Like I I kind of expect at least initially that Simpson's going to get every opportunity to be um, a full full time three down uh, linebacker as opposed to possibly going to dime on passing downs or something like that. Like um, Zach Orr was, you know, that three down yep. linebacker when he was a he was a uh, when he was here when he was playing, and um, Simpson's going to get that same opportunity as Queen. I think. Simpson I really like is a blitzer, like kind of very similar to Queen. You know, the role that Queen played the last two years with Roquan here is being the guy that shoots the gaps, um, blitzes, makes those 
you know, sacks or, you know, tackles for losses in the backfield. And Roquan is just, like you said, that shield that if if they if somebody does break through, he's still making that tackle for a three yard loss. So, yeah, um, I, I, Simpson's got a great mentor and a great partner right next to him in Roquan. It'd be exciting to see how that develops this year. What else I want to talk about? We talked about his missed tackle rate. 6.7% was the second lowest of his career, but his uh, his stops are down a little bit. Um, He's signed through 2027 now. Uh, For some reason, I thought he might have been signed through 2028, or the Ravens might have had an option to extend him by a year. I don't believe they did it. Um, But there's no chance for him to be cut prior to 2026. Uh, so his, his 2025 salary is actually guaranteed. It's 15 million, I think. So he's he'll be here through 2025, no matter what. So we've got at least two more seasons to enjoy Roquan before he could possibly be cut. Any reason to fear with a player his age that his productivity may slip in a way that the Ravens would not like would 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 not be happy with the last couple of years of that contract? I mean. He's he's 27 right now. So these next three years, I I would be surprised, barring an in, obviously an injury that really po- prob- possibly slows him down. It, I would be surprised if we saw a significant drop in his in his actual production. And you know, I think the with the leadership that he brings with the team, I think even if the, we do see a slight dip over the next couple of years i mean i think he probably brings you know added value as being that leader and being that guy that really knows the defense and gets everybody in the right position in order to make make that play so um yeah like i i i would expect um him to be here you know through the life of his contract and i and i would assume that I would hope that the Ravens would probably try to keep him here for the rest of his career, you know, making, you know, another extension probably for less money, but, you know, something that keeps him here for the rest of his career. Cause uh, he's, he's one of those guys that Harbaugh says, you didn't know you were a Raven until you, you were a Raven. He's definitely a guy that's, you know, he's found his home as a Raven. Well, we want him, you know, I, I, I guess the worst case scenario I want him phoning the Ravens when he's ready to retire and say, I want to come back for a one-day contract because I identify with being a Raven. That's actually the lesser thing. What I really want is I want him in the ring of honor. And I don't think he has to do more than play the current contract to get there, given the given the term of it. He'll, he'll have been here from, you know, for parts of six seasons, and that's long enough uh, it, it, to do it. It would be a sure thing if he signed on for an extra three years and, and actually played those years in Baltimore and had you know eight nine years uh, with the team, uh, but it, it is they don't have a backup right now for him is kind of one of my concerns going into the season, is that there's not a player who I really think is is an obvious choice to play that two, even a two down Mike role and I, it wouldn't surprise me if they ended up having to go to the street for it. Yeah, I think that's probably what they would do. Um, is there, there's always, you know, a stopgap middle linebacker that can fill in for a few mm-hmm. games here or there that's out there on the street. I'm sure they have, you know, a list of three or four players that are out there that if, if need be, they could sign to the practice squad and, you know, activate them to the, you know, the game. But yeah, yeah. Like there, there's always that concern when you, you queen could, I guess, could have been that guy last year. And you would see kind of a dip in production probably on both, both positions, but sure. um, there's, there's not that obvious guy that couldn't replace Roquan. And, you know, we, we would see, you know, a pretty significant drop in production there. It, it is always one of the issues with a three down unicorn at inside linebacker is if you lose him, you, you have to replace him with multiple parts or you have to, you really struggle with the total amount of production if you try and replace them with one player. The uh, Ravens have been pretty good about doing it in the past, you know, with players like Bynes and Fort and getting getting players into that uh, that Mike role who were who were good. Fort more of a more of a will guy, but still could play the mic on a passing down, say. Um, but I don't think I don't I wouldn't want Chris Board there. I I don't think that's the that's the solution for it. I don't even think Josh um, Ross 
is the right guy for it. Uh, he may or may not right. be around uh, or on the practice squad or whatever. But I think it's more likely, like you said, that they, they'd uh, end up going to the street and finding a guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's that new jo- uh, Josh Bynes guy that's out there somewhere right now that they, they have ready on speed dial if anything would ever happen. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're probably right. They probably ought to have four of those guys. And it's, you know, it's, it's not a difficult size and shape position to fill when you get right down to it. You want to replace your left tackle and you want 34 inch arms to do it. You got an uphill battle because there aren't very many of those guys who actually have feet that are attached mm-hmm. to that, that 34 inch arms leg. Um, mm-hmm. But if you, if you want an inside linebacker or an athlete, I mean, there's a, there's a huge surplus of athletes who don't have the specific physical traits required of other positions at both middle linebacker and running back. I mean, there's just, there's just tons of them. There's a lot there. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Now I I wanted to read this because I had four things that I hoped he could do in 2023. That would make, that would make him a player. When I, when we did this show last year, it wasn't you and me, but it it was a, but I said one was take over the green dot check on field leadership of the front seven on the fly (laughs) check. Mm-hmm. Continue with outstanding reads, Jack. At least a slight improvement in coverage results would be ideal. And he actually did get that. Not not everybody really probably knows this, but he had, he had a a a, uh, a cut in his yards per target that was good, down to seven point oh this last year from over eight the previous year. Uh, he still, I thought, had a pretty good coverage the, the coverage year the previous year, but he had a really good coverage year this last year, and uh, mm-hmm. and, and that was an improvement. So, uh, you know, he couldn't have done any more to check the boxes for me as a player in 2023 yeah absolutely like same here um like i said since he's come here he's transformed this defense into the best in the league and um you know like people talk about you know how how big of a loss mike mcdonald is and i mean i i'm not trying to discount him in any way but the the thing that took this defense to another level wasn't the hiring of Mike McDonald. It was the acquisition of Roquan Smith. And that that's the point at which we saw this defense become a great defense. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, with, with Zach Orr, who I think is very interesting hired, is very different from, you know, the traditional hires, like they, they made Mike McDonald go, um, go, be defensive coordinator at Michigan because he they wanted somebody to call plays and now they hired Zach Orr who's never called never called a called plays before um so he's it, it's a different new um new new uh hire in something different from them but um I think the relationship that Orr and Roquan probably have is what's going to enable this defense to not really have a a large dip even though they've lost talent at the um at the coaching positions with um with mcdonald and um uh and denard wilson um Mm -hmm. and all of the you know the players that we lost that you know i think i i don't think is as big a deal um especially with wiggins but you know obviously Clowney i think was probably the biggest loss that this defense will have um the way he played but i I, I I don't think it's reasonable to have to, for this the de- defense to be as good as last year, but I, it's going to be a top five defense again this year. Okay, and and, and I was just going to comment on exactly that because they led the league in pretty much everything defensively this last season. It is it, I, you know we're going to see uh, un, unquestionably some regression from this defense just because of the amount of quality players lost. But if they went into this season and they finished fourth or fifth in the league of defense. There's still going to be a lot of crazies out there saying, you know, you let Mike McDonald go. Uh, you didn't make him a plan to be head coach. Or you didn't make him head coach immediately and get rid of Harbaugh now because we need to get rid of Harbaugh now, 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 now. Um, this this <laughs> is a is case where, <laughs> you know, yeah, it is ridiculous. It, 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 you know, Harbaugh has put together these coaching staffs over the year. If they succeed, they're going to go. That's the That's the deal. I mean, that's mm-hmm. you should want that for your coaches because if you don't have it, you probably have a stagnant situation um, that you're going to have a hard time fixing it. Dean Pease was around for a long time, happy being a number two guy. Um, he wasn't a bad defensive coordinator, but he's not in the top three of Ravens ever defensive coordinators. Uh, and they, they 
you know, they, they did need some freshness there. There are people who would say the same thing about urban as well, that it, it, it was just, it was a more of a stagnant situation. He didn't get a coaching, you know, head coaching gig either, but a guy who would, who'd been a very good offensive coordinator, the best offensive coordinator the Ravens have ever had. I mean, yeah, however you want to, you want to, uh, complain about who Urban was. Did I say Brent Urban, by the way? I, uh, yeah, you're Greg, saying Urban. Greg uh, Roman. Greg you Roman, mean sorry. Roman? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So how, whatever you want to do about com- uh, complaining about Greg Roman, the offensive coordinator, take a look at the other guys we've had in that position. Don Strzok might be the second best, you know, and then you you go through all of these guys, you know, Kavanaugh and Fassel for a period of time and Billick doing it himself and Caldwell and, um, uh, Cam and all those guys. I mean, it's just, it, it's, a uh, other than, other than Kubiak, I guess Kubiak would be number two in my book. Um, yeah. th- th- there really one, isn't yeah. anybody else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, you, you want, I, I, I always say you, you want to have as many good problems as you can yep. and having a great, uh, coaching staff where, they're doing a where they're coaching up our players and making our players better, making our defense and team better. And then they go on to better positions elsewhere because, because we have a great head coach here and, you know, we're constantly churning out these defensive coordinators and, you know, they're all succeeding. Like, that that's a good problem to have. It, the the bad problem is to have these average guys that aren't really making your team better, and you're finishing kind of mid you know mid tier. That that that's not the good problem that you want to have. You want to you want to be able to, and you have to be able to trust Harbaugh, who's shown that he can hire these guys and find these guys. And I think he's done a great job, and and it's, and very different from a lot of head coaches who kind of, you know, kind of go in their own circle like they they hire the same guys like you know like i mean even you look at jim harbaugh who you know he hired greg roman as his offensive coordinator again and he's hired a lot of his staff from michigan Michigan and san fran um you know he's hired them back again as opposed to harbaugh has really gone to you know he's gone far and wide and not just bringing back you know, guys that have gone else elsewhere and then gotten fired and that bringing those guys back and things like that. He's constantly refreshing the coaching staff and bringing more ideas and new ideas. And I think that's a good way to handle it. Yeah, it's it's great. I mean, position coaches are the are the NFL gold right now Um, when you, you can get coordinators shouldn't ever bother you to lose coordinators. And And let's talk about just one component of this. And it's this is four percent of the value of hiring great coordinators is if you lose coordinators you might get third round draft picks depending on who your coordinator is okay Mm -hmm. and uh you know zach or is that guy did i do i think that really played into the hiring decision i don't i think that he was probably their guy for a long time as they were going through this season as he was involved in the plan and whatnot i think it's a great side benefit that you lose these guys and i'm i'm kind of i'm sad that they lost anthony weaver not to a head coaching job I mean, it's yeah. not shocking that that would happen, but I'm sad about it. I guess we got to look at it as Tully. I guess the guy from a few years ago who went to the Texans. I think that's the guy, right, Tully? Oh, Greg Cull- David Cully, 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 Cully. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he he had no business being a head coach. So it was right. a, that was we got fortunate at that time. <laughs> that was, but, yeah, uh, that was a gift right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was I I was disappointed in Anthony Weaver too. Like, I mean, I think I think he's got head coach written all over him, um, and. I think if he had stayed here a couple of more years, I think in the next couple of cycling hiring cycles, he would have gotten something. I I hate to say it, but I think he may have regressed his career by taking, you know, the defensive coordinator position because, you know, that defense isn't as talented as this one. Yeah. And, you know, he's already, he's already been getting those head coaching uh, interviews with us. So, you know, now, now you're taking a risk of, you know, with Miami, are are, are they going to be as good? Are they going to be as good as last year or, or not? And, the, you know, they've got a lot of question marks on their defense. So, yeah. People have to recognize that if Miami has a middle of the pack season on defense, that's probably his work, his good work that got them there. And, and you know, the, the lack of doubt. But you're, I mean, you make a great point that, that the Ravens, are in a wonderful position that because the team is so talented and so well run in the front office, they draft so well, 
this is an easy place to hire coaching talent. It's a really easy place to do it. And yeah, it's, it, it is great that they do it. It's great. You have ownership that probably is willing to pay a few extra dollars where it's needed to, to get, you know, some of the real stars in, in, in terms of coaching, but uh, uh, you know, and, and probably also has some good discipline to say no when it's time to say no on that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, mm-hmm. it's, it, I'm, uh, I, I think the, the, the carpings to get rid of Harbaugh are, have, have so little actual substance behind them at this point. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't take them seriously. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, anyway, we don't, we don't want to go to that. Let's go back to Roquan Smith. What is a good season for Roquan Smith this year? So I had um, helped make a uh, smooth transition from McDonald uh, to or and any scheme or personnel adjustments, you know, obviously help that make it make that a, a smoother transition. And, you know, and I, and I will say, like, my my predictions for Roquan are kind of more based on a total defense, because I think he like a quarterback is to the offense, you, you, like a quarterback is an outsized um, uh, pro- producer of an offense and makes an offense better. Um, Ro- I think Roquan's kind of that same player on defense. So like I'm looking at the defense as a whole because, you know, that's, that's kind of where I, just kind of how I see them. And, um, you know, I also said, you know, we see a slight drop off in defensive effectiveness due to the loss of talent and coaching and players, which is something, you know, we've already talked about and um, continue to be the heart and brain of the defense and um, just be that solid, excellent um, middle linebacker that he's been, you know, his, his entire two years here. Okay. I, I, I really like those comments and I like putting it in context of the total defense because certainly what he's asked to do a lot is to be that glue to hold it together. I have plus fifth plays 15 plus games with a slight drop off from his 22 to 23 rate statistics. And by the way, slight drop off, he's still going to be very close to the pro ball slash all pro voting, whether it means AP two or AP one. Um, but he remains one of the best inside linebackers in the game due to a broad set of positives, awareness, and on field leadership can probably still make the pro bowl with a drop off like this, but I'm not making that a condition. If he didn't make the pro bowl for some reason, I think he could still be a great player. And I think he could still have a good season. We've just been so incredibly spoiled so far by a year and a half of unbelievably great Roquan that I'm not sure that we can all put in context there that he could have a drop off and it'd still be a good season. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How about, how about a great year? Okay. Um, again, trying to do all the things I mentioned in the good season. Um, also see no, uh, no drop off or, uh, or even an improvement in the overall defense effectiveness, um, this year as opposed to last year. So if we see, you know, this being just, again, the absolute best defense in the league, uh, Roquan's going to be a huge part of that, um, you know, both on the field and, you know, with his leadership and, you know, helping, helping being that coach on the field. It's, you know, it, he's going to be a big reason for that. And I also said, uh, make some, a few more splash plays such as sacks, interceptions that puts him in the conversation as uh, for a defensive player of the year. Um, okay. He was eighth in that in that voting this last yeah, year, so he yeah, he was in the conversation. Eight. Fair to say, yeah, right? yeah. I, I guess I would I would say top top two or three, something like okay. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. I, I've got a, a great season. It's kind of lengthy here. I say he's healthy for sixteen plus games plus all of the postseason. He continues at a level very similar to twenty two twenty three on a rate basis. He improves his stop to miss tackle ratio slightly to back to north of his career rate of 4.9%. His role morphs as needed to maximize the aggregate inside linebacker play. I'm I'm not making him responsible for the whole defense, but I like the way you're doing it because he's the communication hub of the defense. Uh, Mm -hmm. They they need another guy to be captain of the secondary too. And I think that's Marcus Williams, but uh, they, they, they need him to be a great communicator as well uh, for the, for the front seven. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, role morphs is needed to maximize aggregate inside linebacker play, and Simpson or the and or the dime thrives next to him in a role designed for big plays. So I'm I'm de-emphasizing Roquan's big play opportunities to try and get more for that weak side linebacker slash dime. 
And it could be for other players as well because that's the way the Ravens have played it in 23. Uh, the Ravens' pass rush continues to shine with effective contributions from inside linebacker, but not necessarily from Smith. On-field leadership is apparent both before in terms of repositioning and after in terms of def- effectively demanding accountability, the play. So you you know as a player what I mean by effectively demanding accountability, but he's got to be able to go over to the guy who messed, his, messed up his assignment and in the most productive way address that situation. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, sometimes, you know, if you're, if you're – Marlon Humphrey, you turn your you turn your head to the side and you get visibly upset with the player next to you. And Marlon may realize he's doing that or not. Uh, I'm sure he's been told by now. Uh, if you're LJ Fort, you go over and give Patrick Queen a low five for not being in the right place, and then you, you have words about where you should have been on that. You know, that's you got to be behind right. seven because you're there. You know, what, whatever his responsibility on the play was, Fort communicates him to. But whatever, however he does this, he needs to guy, be a guy who who does it well. I, I think everybody who's been a Ravens fan for since they came to Baltimore would say Ray Lewis was the best ever at doing it. I mean, he would take these people in, grab them by the helmet, and talk to them for for a few seconds. And uh, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, I want to see yeah. that from Walker. Yeah, yeah, I'm exactly the same. Yeah, I mean, that's you, you, so many of the big mistakes have been eliminated since he's been here. That I, I think he's probably doing this in film study. Um, you know, during the week, throughout the week, when they're having de- defensive meetings, hey, you need to be in position when they when the team does this. I need you to slant this way, or you know, whatever whatever the case may be, um, so that you don't see it that much in the game. But I'm sure even in the game, as somebody you know misses an assignment here, or there, he's you know he's telling them in his own way, hey, you need to you need to do something else right there. Yeah. All right absolutely fantastic always talking football with you brandon why don't you tell folks where they can talk football with you online sure i'm on uh twitter at uh brandon croxton five um you know i love talking f- football love talking ravens all right other folks out there if you'd like to be on a film study short hit me up uh the expectation series is all taken but if you want to do a recollection series and i'm going to be starting a new one as we approach camp about biggest camp questions if you have an idea or a thought or a concern about what are the biggest what are the biggest things the Ravens need to fix entering camp, uh, they need to questions they need to resolve, uh, hit me up. Uh, DMs are always open on Twitter. I want to hear from you. I'll get back to you very quickly. Brandon, thanks again for coming on. Thank you. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study. <laughs>